bit anyway. Jennifer was, Caleb took our truck, I have his truck, and I kept the car here, and Jennifer had the convertible this morning to come to church. <laughs> and the top doesn't work. <laughs> so she hustled here, and somebody helped her put the top up. So uh, she looks a little windblown today. You know, that's okay. Hey, can you tell that Bible school is happening? Yes. Amen. Come on. Isn't it the USS uh, Irene? Yeah. And uh, woo -hoo. And uh, yeah, a lot of work went into it. Mike and uh, uh, Ron were here. Yeah. All day yesterday and hours of days before getting stuff done with more to do so it's really taking place and continue to prayer there's a lot that uh, still needs to be covered and coming together there are some cards that you can give out to people and invite and so that would be a wonderful thing as well so updates our friend Ethel has is home so she's maybe behaving but she's at home uh, Joyce is still at Mary Freebed she hopes by the end of this week to come and she's going to stay with one of her daughters for a, a while. And uh, Sherry is still not doing real well, right? I did visit with her at Ambrose Ridge and pray for her. She has many appointments. And, and our friend Nancy Costanacas will be having heart mer a heart valve surgery this Friday. Pretty significant. They will be putting a valve in. And, uh, so they were doing it. Somebody, I think probably some, an animal, I just heard of somebody that had valve surgery and they had two valves replaced. One was a pig, one was a cow <laughs> in the person's heart. So it is amazing what they can do with that, isn't it? So remember them as people are coming and going. And there's decorating on Wednesday. I know there's a lot of work to be done, but it's coming. We, again, are thankful for our church angels that have been here and uh, Sarah and Katie been doing a bang up job and Jennifer of course and she just got out of school Friday so now she's even ramping up a little further so time flies that's for sure so it's good we're grateful opportunity for us to be here so our call to worship is taken from Psalm we'll spend some time in, the, in this Psalm today and then opening prayer with Jim so let's read together the law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And the commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Isn't that a great passage it's from, uh, from David? Lead us in opening prayer, and we'll do some songs. <coughs> Heavenly Father, it's so good, I've said this many times, but to be with the family. We're thankful for each one here, for what they mean, what we mean to each other, to encourage one another, to love one another. Help us to continue to strive to do even that better. We thank you for the love that you show to us. You are faithful and just. Your word is just changes lives. It tells of your love and your mercy and your grace. So we thank you, Lord, as we come together this morning to worship. We're thankful, God, for the opportunity to serve at VBS. We pray, Father, for the souls that those young boys and girls that will be coming to hear you and how much Jesus loves them. Help us to convey that in a, here in a language that is simple and understandable to their hearts. Again, we thank you, Lord, for each person here this morning. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now the back. And uh, gotta get the right I gave Dave the order of service. 
from last week. <laughs> Just to mess him up a little bit, but we got the right one for him. The, there, ma'am. The, come on, cool. So, you know, this is, some of you may need to pray for me a little bit more, but I'm a real Top Gun fan. <laughs> I don't know if you enjoy the movie Top Gun and the music. My kids, I love planes. My kids grew up with it 20 years ago and F-14s and uh, enjoyed that. And then, of course, there's the remake, Maverick, which is a great film. And, uh, but you'll remember, the it, we all knew it was coming out, right? And then they, they'd show a trailer and it'll, it'll wet your whistle a little bit about it. And it's, oh, that's, oh, oh, wow. You know, and they're, what are they going to do and how are they going to repeat it? And then COVID hit. And so, that, and so they kept redoing, and the thing was made, I understand, but they kept changing the trailers. It'll give you a little snapshot here and, and music here and a little bit finally. And then after, I think, a year or two, it finally came out and they, they showed the movie and you got to go to, go to see it. It's like, ah, oh, the final, the revelation, it came. We've been anticipating it all this time. And uh, if you've enjoyed it, that's great. There are other movies that you watch the trailer and you go, was that the same one I just saw? You know, it's pretty bad, and all they do is show you stuff that you think you'd like it, and it has nothing to do with it. But it's this trailer. So where am I going with this? Well, as we look at the Word of God, it's not a perfect example, but God's giving a snippet. He's just revealing what the best is yet to come. And the anticipation is building for it. And, and with God, we don't, there's no disappointment. And someday, I mean, you thought certain movies and cinematography were something else. Wait till you see God's return. Can you imagine the skies opening up, trump of God going off, dead in Christ rising. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord. So shall we ever live with the Lord. That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? And so that's the revealing that's going to come ultimately. And in the meantime, he's instructed us and guided us in our scriptures. And we spent a couple of weeks uh, a while back and just to run and reinforce this aspect of the sufficiency of the scripture. Today we're going to look at a psalm and for the next couple of weeks, Psalm 19, and that's of David. And David wrote the psalm. Is it in there, ma'am? I, I put it, she may need some assistance to make sure that's up there. It's called the Revealed Perfection. And that should be in there, because I did forward, put it in the share uh, file with it. Thank you. So turn with me in your scriptures. Let's just uh, look at what David said. We read it uh, at the beginning, and we'll redo that. We won't go through all of it today. But there's a little bit more. Now, first of all, think of David. Think of his life. Uh, lions and bears and giants and Philistines and running and hiding and beating people up and you know what a lifestyle and ups and downs that he had and, and in the midst of all you kind of go how in the world can an average person survive and make it through and of course that's why the psalms are there and it's deep and entrenched with him and, and he talks about what the word of God has done for him and that was the stabilizing now again they didn't have the bible as we have it it was just the law and the prophets but it and they would have some of the psalms earlier on but it was what sustained him so let's look at ch uh, chapter 19 of the psalm I want to and we'll show you a little bit more when it comes up this the first uh, six verses we call it general or natural revelation now I know that's a big theological term but this revelation is a part where God is revealing himself to us and in theology, which is a study of God, there's two ways God does it. Kind of a general revelation, or, uh, or which is just like Romans 1 says, you look outside and see his creation. And, wow, something's behind this. And when you look bad, that looks familiar. So let's read uh, the first couple of verses of Psalm 19. This is the, this is the general revelation. This is not... This doesn't have anything that it leads to salvation, but doesn't lead it, doesn't introduce Christ. It just says, hey, there's God, and I'm here in a big way. So this is what it says. The heavens declare the glory of God, 
and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. I'm going to show you some images from the, this new show. Yeah, that's James Webb. It, it's even better than the Hubble. And, and it, it, they can see clearer and further out, and the, the immensity, the enormity of the universe. And God created it all. And they are proclaiming, they're revealing the handiwork of God behind it. So day to day they pour out speed, and night to night reveal knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words whose voice has been heard. You can't hear it, but you see it. It's being revealed to them. Their voice goes out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent. And you get this pavilion aspect of the sun coming up and light comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It rises, rising is from the end of the heavens and is circulate at the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So you get this idea even as the world turns, I'm not talking soap opera here, is that still on as the world turns? I think in some ways it's how the world churns, <laughs> right? But it is, the sun, east to where the sun comes up and sets, the orderliness of the planets and God's working there. This is what they call uh, general revelation. And uh, it, it's good, general or natural revelation, this first part. And this is like Romans chapter one. It says, God's handiwork has been revealed from the beginning, ultimately, so they have no excuse. They have to saw, somehow behind this incredible design, someone somehow created. It really is odd, a huge step of faith to think that it happened from nothing. Amino acids, you know, in evolutionary kind of form. So get a look at some of these things. And that's just, that, those are galaxies, right? They're stars. Phenomenal, uh, and, and this is what God, God created. And so that's the first half of this, as the psalmist goes on, David goes, and think of, well, think of the shepherd at night watching the sheep. You ever been up north where there's no you know, city lights and been to places in the sky and just seems to light up with the stars? Of course, they can only see with the naked eye. Think of what we can see now, isn't that phenomenal? You would think people would get more awed by the more we can see out there. But the Lord it knows what he's doing. And so then he transitioned David to chapter, in the same chapter to verse 7, and he talks about the scriptures. So here's some background. This is what we call supernatural or special revelation, where God is revealing salvation and truth through the vehicle Median, the Word and the Holy Spirit, he's communicating directly. General revelation or natural is just you looked in the psalm and wow, that's cool. Special is like, oh, I'm hearing God's voice through the Spirit of God through these words. And that leads to salvation. And so David here is going to be using a lot of different synonyms. Now you go, oh my word, I don't remember English class. It just, did some of you just shake when you thought about English? You know, Jennifer's not here, you can say yes. <laughs> but you know, a, a synonym, similar words. So David is, it, in his, his style, in this poetic form, it has a synonyms of describing different aspects of the word of God. And then the benefit of it. So there's like a declaration and then a benefit from the word of God. Are you going to follow the right one? We're going to do half of them today. And the first one is that it's perfect. So it says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Anybody like being around a perfectionist? <laughs> they, I mean, it, it's a special gift, but they can also drive you nuts. Uh-huh. Uh, and then a perfectionist one is one that has like 14,000 projects out at once and never gets them all done. That's just kind of their positive or negative side of that. But here's the, when the word of God now says here, the law of the Lord is perfect. Now just what's your reaction? If that word law means instruction or direction. So I'm gonna give you other um, definitions of the, the English Hebrew words. So this word perfect means whole and complete and sufficient. Now think about that. 
the, the instructions of the Lord are complete, or the directions of the Lord are whole, or the law of the Lord is sufficient. So David is saying, it is perfect. Now, there's a lot of scrutiny that sometimes goes into the word. It does to me a couple of things we don't completely understand. But even David, 3,000 years ago, said, God's law or his instruction or his directions are whole and complete. And they are to such an extent that they revive the soul. This is just not a stopgap. This isn't just something to make somebody feel good. It's the inner being satisfaction that nothing else can satisfy. There's a lot of things that we can look to to try to feel at peace or enjoyment or whatever, but until that internal longing and that God space and vacuum that we have with our Heavenly Father, until that's met, we are never complete and our soul is struggling. An interesting word, reviving. A similar word that David's going to use in Psalm 23, the Good Shepherd, and he revives our soul. I've used it from time to time, that, uh, that word cast. The soul is cast. That's a sheep that falls over heavy lake with heavy wool. It can't get up and its feet are dangling. It'll die. And it's open to predators. It's a cast sheep. Cast me not away. Cast out. That's where the English part comes in. And, and God is exceptionally good through his word and his spirit that reviving the castness of our human being from the inside out. It's not just a band-aid. A lot of people are looking at other isms from the things they drink and watch and do to mask. It's just temporary. But God heals the soul. That's exciting. And you know what? There are times we don't see it. We've been praying people. But don't forget the power of God. Because it's always at work. Even the hardest heart can be broken and continue to pray. I was... I was looking at Luke uh, 9 this week and as so I'm going through the scriptures, and it just struck me. Jesus sent out 70, and they came back, and he, he sent them out, and he said, go into and heal them, heal the sick. But, and it never caught me before. It says, say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. I never saw that really before. Like, it sounds like Paul's Ron sentence, just like they had to fill it with something. No, it's significant. They're going to be healed and remind them they're healed because the kingdom of God is coming with power. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. It transforms, it renews. When we come to, sometimes there's physical healings, but when we come to Christ, we're ultimately healed spiritually because the kingdom of God has come near and into you. That's kind of exciting, isn't it? Think about that. And even in the realm of spiritual reality, every child that comes through that door in a couple weeks, there's a fight for their soul. You know? We don't know who God ultimately has chosen or elected God, but there is a fight they don't, Satan does not want that individual to hear about Christ. They don't want their heart, they want their hearts to be hardened. Does not want them to respond because he's just bitter and ornery and wants to thwart the plans of God. And here we have the message to revive hearts and lives and restore and ultimately name written in the book of life and bring them in the presence of God. Isn't that cool? What a great opportunity that we have. And we have the privilege of bringing the kingdom near to them. We can't make them jump, but we can bring it near to them and heal their hearts and their minds. That's pretty cool. So the law is perfect. Next time we have an argument with God. <laughs> He's always right, isn't he? That's a hard lesson to learn sometimes, but we learn as we go along. It's perfect. But that word means, it means whole and complete and sufficient. The next thing is that it is sure. So when you have issues mechanically with your car, it never happens, right? You call Brian. 
<laughs> At least get some abundance of counsel or their wisdom <laughs> or others. But I don't know about you, but having a mechanic you trust really makes a difference, right? So we were looking at some, and I won't mention the shop, but the, the truck needed suspension, two or three different things, shocks, and, and, and I got a quote from a shop that was like three or four grand. And I went, whoa, 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 are you, are you kidding me for something like that? And then I did a little, not my little fingers through the walking, maybe the young guys don't want that many things. And I found another shop that did it for like 2,000, 2,500, stood behind it. Then I found out later that that place I originally had a reputation for uh, ripping people off. And I don't know about you, but when you don't know how mechanics work, you want to trust the mechanic, right? And, and somebody that's proven themselves and, and that you take into the mechanic that you trust. Well, God is reliable. One of the things of the word here in 7b is the testimony of the Lord. That word, the statutes, NIV says, uh, ESV says, the testimony of the Lord is sure to the point of making the simple wise. Wow. Now that's a pretty, if I can use the word, bodacious statement. Who in the world would say that? And yet to think of, it's, it's a sure thing. So that Hebrew word means trustworthy. Sure means trustworthy, believable, faithful, reliable, proven. It's like you go to a mechanic that has been, you know, yeah, they may find something else, but they're, being up and honest with you, they're not trying to sell you for breaking something or you know, that kind of a thing. Where God's word is sure. And it, it, the testimony word also means statutes. It means kind of an oath or covenant. So as we interact with the word of God and the Holy Spirit's enlightening us, it, this oath and covenant we have, an English word there is testimony. When you're, I guess I'm playing off this mechanics thing again, but if, how many times we've heard if we needed some, something done to our house or mechanic, we want to hear from somebody that had somebody that did it, that they did good work, right? And that they were qualified, they cleaned up, they did what they said, they didn't overcharge you, and you were happy with the results. And so here it is, that the, he, the word of God is sure, it's trustworthy, just it is, it is believable, it is faithful, reliable, and not only the testimony, but this is interesting, this is the self-declaration of God. His word revealing to us is, yo, everybody, this is who I am. It's sure, and it's true. Let me read for you just a moment, this is, I'm using the Amplified Bible this year in my Bible reading, which is kind of neat. It, it takes a lot of liberties, but it actually is a lot. It fills in and, and gives added insight to each verse. But I'm going to read down underneath here in the commentary. It says, the law of the Lord, the world reveals God's glory. That's that natural revelation, general revelation. And the word reveals his saving grace. God's law or teaching is described as perfect which is best understood here as complete. This law needs no alteration in part or in whole. It has power to bring deep and radical change in the interior life or soul. It is God's great instrument for conversion. The word of God is spoken as God's testimony because it is own, his own instruction concerning his person and purpose. In scripture, God testifies concerning himself, his son and sinners. God's word is sure and may be trusted because he is faithful. To those wise in their own eyes, the truth of God is hidden. But to the simple, the scriptures give wisdom that leads to salvation. Isn't that powerful? It may have been a lot to read and to absorb but that's what David is getting across here with his, his poetic form and the genre of, 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 of a synonym describing the word and the benefit of it. And he's talking about it's sure, it's stable. 
One of the things I know Jennifer's mentioned because she teaches some of the harder courses in upper grade, you know, who likes advanced 11th and 12th grade college prep English and they're reading Chaucer and they're reading Shakespeare, Billy Shakespeare. And I mean, some of that stuff's hard, and, you know, to teach that. And it, more than once, she'll have a student at the end of the year, well, how'd you like it? Oh, that was a tough class. I didn't like it at, you know, at first, but you made me work hard and I learned more than I ever have before. And that's a little testimony of her and giving her a shout out. And that's just the giftedness of a teacher. But there's something to be learned and it doesn't come easy and we work at it and it's good for us. And that's what the script, this is the God's testimony, it's trustworthy and sure. And it even makes the simple wise. Huh? Wisdom. And hopefully that you and I, as we grow continue, are teachable so that he can instruct us and continue to guide us. Right. So part of this word right that it talks about here, it says the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. So precepts also mean instruction, procedure, or principle. Then they give you background. And right is moral or just. Kind of the Old Testament Hebrew word is that there's nothing crooked. It's straight arrow. So we got a different boat this last fall, and it didn't have numbers on it. You know, the MC and the numbers on it. So when we got it out this spring, we had to put numbers on it. So here I am with the sticky numbers. You ever tried that? It, it tried to get them even and <laughs> straight. I had to put like masking tape under, because the bow, every, the fiberglass is always moving, right? It's different in here. And how to get it straight and get all my MC and my letters right, and distance between, and then you get your sticker on the one side. Uh, gratefully that the packet I had had four of each letter. <laughs> because even though you duplicate it on each side, uh, some of them are like, oh, that was crooked, or got that and stretched out, because it wasn't quite straight. I was a little crooked. Pray for me. Now, pray for, I also want to replace, there's a strip of blue red all the way around the bottom that's been banged up, and I want to replace that. Now, that will be the ultimate test of how I can do it straight. If anybody have wisdom, let me know. Um, but it's like, you're going to have 23 feet going back in the front, and to get it straight, uh, that will be the challenge. Hopefully, I won't lose my sanctification with it. But God's word is straight shooting. Yes, it's, it's poignant. Yes, it hits hard. But when you, when you are the truth and you speak the truth, there is, it, is, it is right. Now, as we do it, we do it in grace and love. But God says, I am who I am. I am trustworthy. I am true. I am right. I'm a straight arrow in my principles or the instructions, the procedures. They are morally just and right. So let's just have a little, I don't know about fun, but one of the big arguments about evolution is besides that you have supposedly these amino acids in this gobbledy goop and lightning strikes and it has life and begins to add, you know, grow, first of all, where in the world did any of that come from? Origin, right? So you have water, you have these amino acids, you have the sand, where did it come from? You can't explain it. But here's another affective aspect of it. Where does morality, where does the emotion, where does the ethics come from? So you got a blob, even if it did mutate and morph and evolve into something, we are people have a conscience even the unbeliever recognizes that. Where did a conscience come from? Because we're made in the image of God. There's a moral compass within us. It's being adjusted, but it's there. In fact, in Romans chapter 2, Paul says to the church that the, that the law has been written on the hearts of people. So not only they're made in his image and the similarities of aspects of image bearers, but that the, this affective, this subjective, this thing, there's no, there's no organ called moral ethics. 
Now, emotions are one thing, and they can get messed up in a lot of different ways, but there is this, this straightness, this rightness, this moral fiber within us that God created. It didn't evolve. It couldn't evolve. It was just protoplasm. And that's part of being in its image, and he adjusts it, and it's right. And, you writ, and it, what it should do, and it does, it says here, it makes glad, joyful the inner being. To know truth. It says it rejoices the heart. That word is also means happy or joyful. It's kind of a paradox. Law, and yet that makes us happy. And yet the concept of having standards, stability, boundaries, morals and ethics reveal and satisfy <coughs> it's huge and that's part of what the word does and in our inner being and sometimes maybe the joy isn't there because maybe sometimes we're veering out a wee bit and not following rightness and deep down inside and more often than not when we talk to somebody that's making some poor choices if they're honest and deep, say, you know, the deep down inside, you know that's not right. And more often than not, they say, I know, I just don't want to change. Because it's that inner aspect, especially if they're a believer kind of going around the block a little bit or prodigal. The last one, yeah, eyeballs. I just want to, so as David goes on to say here, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. I read this a few years ago, but the eyeball is just a fascinating thing. There are so many working parts. It says the eye are more, is the most complex organ in the body, except for the brain. They are composed of more than two million working parts. Under the right conditions, eyes can discern the light of a candle at a distance of 14 miles. Whoa. Eyes process 36,000 bits of information every hour with the tape. You know, that natural revelation, think about that eye. Eyes uh, contribute towards 85% of your total knowledge. So those, if you're education, they have different kind of learners, and one is one that has to see, and guys mostly are that type of thing. Additional eyes utility, 65% of all the pathways to the brain. Now, if you look a little closely, there's, I was talking to an eye dollars years ago, different aspects of that as it goes back in the brain and your iris, it's a pretty phenomenal thing. Eyes can instantly set in motion hundreds of muscles and organs in your body. You know, you react to something. Just think how quickly that works. In a normal lifespan, your eyes will bring you almost 24 million images of the world around you. Woo! The external muscles that move the eyes are the most strongest muscles in the human body for the job they have to do. They are a hundred times more powerful than they need to be. How as it sets up within the person's heart mind. It's just a phenomenal thing of the eye. That's, I don't know if that was natural or they threw some color within that, but uh, that's something else to see the eye. So that's what Dave is referring to here. He's talking about that the eye that if the word of God is pure, and it's such a purity, the command, that it enlightens, it illuminates the eye. Think about that with you. The command's also synonymous with instruction, procedure, and statutes. Pure is upright, straight, and smooth. Enlightening, spiritually insightful, illuminating, lights on, you know, to do that, and accepting the eye. What a phenomenal thing, and it's pure. That's a phenomenal aspect of David's looking at the word. And so we'll just pause for a moment and, and uh, get ready to wrap things up. So, yes, some of you are very kind and, and expressed uh, uh, acknowledgement of uh, another year of life for uh, yours truly. 
I'm uh, 39 <laughs> and holding <laughs> and holding and holding and holding. But you know, as the years go, you, you have a sense of reflection. And I look at that, and each age is significant and, and different now with a season of life with mom and dad not here and difference going forward. And God's been gracious and blessed and with my brother. But you look back, and, I, and this week too, I just I, I couldn't help but just think back and reflect. And, and maybe with a little more wisdom, maybe with a little more honesty, to see God's hand through the years, all 39 years of life, or been some, you know, and, and how he moved, and how the word of God was such an integral part of that. And those times when, when, and he even took me to the spiritual woodshop, the woodshed. You know, there were times, Kurt, I gotta break this part of you. There's times when I needed to be reminded of who and what he was and that he could be trusted. There are times that I just, in the midst of chaos and discernment, that I only one day at a time and trust him, and he's gonna provide, and he's proven himself faithful year after year after year, amen? And how else do you learn that? It's not like you learn that in school. You got to experience. So as I'm looking at that, this, the Word of God is such a central part of it, and you understand that Jesus is the living Word of God, and that when He got off the scene, He said, "I'm sending the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit's going to illuminate. He's, he's going to take these the pen and ink, and He's going to make it spiritual, and He's going to flood you with My words and My thoughts, My will, and My encouragement, if you listen." And if we hear, and if we respond, and, and it's learned. And so I'm still learning, you know, I've talked to folks that I'm not wet behind the ear anymore, I'm just damp. Because <laughs> I still got a lot to learn, amen? amen? But hopefully we maintain a, a teachable spirit, that the Word of God, in different ways as we in self-discipline study it, allows the Spirit of God to, to teach us. I find myself having just shut up. <laughs> more often. <laughs> the other day I was praying, listening, God, I need some ideas here. I need some, Lord, I need this. And the Lord said, if you'd be quiet, I can give you some insight. <laughs> I'm just rattling off my prayer. I'm doing my spiritual duty, but I'm not sitting and listening. That's hard work. I'm not really good at it. But where else does the Spirit of God speak through His Word? Maybe, you know, Two eyes, one mouth, or two ears, one mouth, right? So that's part of what I'm learning, and, and it always reinforces the Word of God and that it's true. I don't have, I don't have a song to sing at the end, that's okay. But at the end of this psalm is a benediction. In a few moments, I'm going to have to stand and we're going to say it. it would, I would encourage you maybe to memorize it. I'd encourage you to say that. Maybe in a prayer at the end of the day or at some point. It's, it's a wonderful, kind of, you know, the, in the hymn book we talk about hymns of aspiration. It's, it's, we want to aspire. We're looking to God and it's a confession and a prayer and an openness to God, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So allow me to close in prayer and then we'll stand and then we'll repeat this psalm as our, our conclusion. Gracious Father, your word is powerful, it's true, it has been tested through the time, it is accurate, it is in, enabled by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. It has saved us from so many heartaches. Sometimes the lessons we've learned to trust it, to obey and to follow, Lord, but we thank you. Now we as David, as we conclude today, Father, ask that we would be faithful to it, that we may be encouraged and blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me, please. And this is our closing benediction, and may it be your prayer uh, at other points and times throughout your week. Let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. All God's people said.